two things we need to consider when conducting behavior analytic research and or when we're engaged in behavior analytic practice are treatment integrity and social validity. Treatment integrity, sometimes known as procedural integrity or treatment fidelity, refers to the extent to which the independent variable is implemented as planned. So certainly in research, we'd wanna have some indice that if we're evaluating perhaps a new curriculum, a new methodology for teaching, we'd wanna have some indice that that teaching methodology or that curriculum was implemented as planned, right? So if we're conducting research with, uh, in a school system and teachers are implementing the curriculum, they need to implement it to a certain fidelity. In practice, when we're functioning as behavior analysts, treatment integrity obviously is important, right? So when we design an intervention that, uh, for a particular skill deficit or for trying to reduce a problematic behavior, the intervention should be implemented in a particular way. And um, <clears throat> if I pick out one intervention in particular, something like a token economy, there are a lot of components to a token economy. There is a token delivery schedule, there's a token exchange schedule. Um, the, the values of the, the tokens mean different things. Um, when tokens are awarded, are they awarded contingent on good behavior or for the absence of problem behavior? So there are a lot of moving parts. So it, it stands to reason that during the implementation of a token economy, the implementer is bound to make some errors. Well, if we consider treatment integrity, uh, and we have a method of measuring treatment integrity, then we could sort of identify where uh, any limitations or any weaknesses in the implementation of the intervention exist and then hopefully correct them. So one of the prerequisites for addressing or assessing treatment integrity would be that uh, the independent variable must be defined and or described very clearly, right? And that sort of harkens back to our discussion of Bear, Wolf, and Risley in 1968, the concept of technological. That is, our procedures, whether in research or practice, are written in such a way that uh, the average trained individual could read those descriptions or protocols and carry out the intervention or independent variable. <clears throat> So if we're assessing treatment integrity, it could range from low to high. That is, we could have treatment implemented with 100% integrity, meaning that uh, the implementers made no errors. So if we were to observe them over uh, multiple sessions or multiple days, we might see them implement the treatment with a high degree of integrity, so 100%. They made no errors. Um, at another time, we could observe the implementers and we might see that they make a few errors, right? So we, we want to, again, somehow devise a methodology for measuring treatment integrity. And that's going to vary depending upon what you're doing, whether you're teaching skill or reducing a behavior. Each intervention has different components that we would have to account for. If we consider some of the threats to treatment integrity, one that has been discussed in the past has been procedural drift, right? I think we, we talked about this when we discussed inner observer agreement, um, that there could be drift in the way things are recorded. Well, here you might have drift in the way a procedure is implemented. So for example, if um, you are targeting self-injurious behavior in the form of headbanging and self-scratching. Uh, if the individual, and you have contingencies associated with those target behaviors. So for example, the individual does not earn a token if they engage in those targets. It is quite possible that the person implementing the plan, if they see another target behavior that they feel is uh, problematic, like self-biting, they may implement the contingency for that and that would be incorrect, right? So we, we have to stick to a plan. If we have a written protocol, we stick to that protocol. Another possibility might be that the uh, a target behavior occurs and there should have been a contingency carried out or implemented, but the implementer failed to carry it out, right? So again, you have sort of these um, 
<clears throat> these errors of omission, so to speak. So the something should have happened, but the implementer or the person implementing the treatment did not act accordingly. So one of the ways that we could achieve high treatment integrity, uh, particularly if we're functioning as a consultant or we're training individuals to implement our interventions, is to have a very specific uh, and comprehensive treatment or I'm sorry, a uh, training approach to implementing the treatment. So training and practice, right? It, uh, not unlike when we're bringing about behavior change in the individuals who work, if we're training somebody to implement a protocol, an intervention, there is training and practice. There is uh, a criterion set for accuracy in our uh, observations of the person implementing the treatment. And we need to assess each, each component of the treatment, right? So if we have something, again, like a token economy, there are multiple components. Some treatments only have one, right? If you're assessing how well a parent delivers positive reinforcement for appropriate behavior, there's really only one thing to assess. <clears throat> did, they, did they deliver reinforcement contingent on the appropriate behavior or did they not deliver reinforcement? So you yeah, need to consider all the different components. Uh, obviously with training, there are a lot of ways in which we could do it. We could use something complex like behavioral skills training, something you probably discussed in your interventions class. Uh, simple verbal instructions, reading instructions, modeling and rehearsal. Generally, behavior in behavior analysis, we use some combination of, of these. Um, certainly behavioral skills training being an important one, but at a minimum, uh, some semblance of verbal instructions, modeling and rehearsing and or practice. Video modeling could, could be effective. So the idea here is we want to provide the person who will be implementing or persons who will be implementing the treatment <clears throat> with a general training uh, of how to implement that treatment. Now, when we're capturing data on so uh, treatment integrity, uh, again, you need to consider all the possible iterations of what can happen. And again, we can't account for every possible scenario, but there are certainly uh, some important things that we need to consider. So let's take the example of differential reinforcement of other behavior, right? So DRO. <clears throat> so how would we go about determining if a parent or a teacher is implementing that intervention correctly? So we have it written out. Um, we know that there are things that the person should do contingent on the absence of problem behavior during a certain period of time, and there are probably things that they should do contingent on the occurrence of problem behavior. Uh, we need to set up observations, and again, we provide the training, and now we say, go at it, uh, implement this intervention. So we wanna start collecting data, <clears throat> right? So let's just look at the procedural steps first. Uh, set a countdown timer for two minutes. So let's just say this is a two minute DRO. That is a procedural step that they would have to do. So we would wanna to observe to make sure that occurs. Contingent on SIB resets the timer, right? So this is an instance where uh, the person implementing the DRO needs to act or needs to do something when the participant engages in a targeted behavior. Then, of course, contingent on no SIB uh, and the sound of the elapsed timer, the person delivers one edible reinforce, right? So that's another consideration. And then they need to reset the timer. So I'm not saying these are all the steps in implementing a DRO, but if we sort of break it down to these critical features that we could observe and measure, uh, this might be the core steps. Now, the other interesting thing about assessing treatment integrity for behavioral interventions, particularly those targeting uh, behavior reduction, is that we there's only so many opportunities, right? We can, obviously we could probably do some modeling and role playing and create opportunities, but when we're trying to assess treatment integrity in the natural environment with the uh, targeted individual, if they don't engage in problem behavior, there is no opportunity for the in the implementer to demonstrate the skill, right? Or if they engage in a lot of problem behavior, there may not be um, an opportunity for 
the participant or the, the implementer to conduct some other aspect of the treatment. So if you follow me through this simple data collection sheet, this is sort of, um, these are made up data, but let's just say that we're observing the parent for a half hour. And in that half hour, there was um, an opportunity where they start the intervention. So they set the timer and they did it correctly, right? And we could collect other data, correct, incorrect, prompted versus unprompted. Um, so let's just say over the multiple observations that there were about five opportunities where they had to initially set the timer for two minutes and they did it correct every time. So now we have 100% integrity you know, over the course of our observations. Let's just say again during our observations that um, there were two opportunities during which the, the implementer should have reset the timer contingent on the occurrence of SIB. So let's just say we're observing them implementing it and we see that SIB occurred and they reset the timer once. Okay, and then later on SIB occurred again, but they forgot to reset the timer. So that's 50% uh, correct or 50% integrity for that component of the treatment. <clears throat> Coming down here to um, what happens after the timer elapses and there's no behavior, no targeted behavior. So let's just say there were three opportunities for that during our observation and the implementer carried it out correctly twice, right? So we have 66% and then they reset the timer. So hopefully you see what, what I'm trying to point out here is that um, by way of this example with the DRO, there are multiple things we need to consider if we wanna evaluate the integrity with which a treatment is implemented, right? And this is a good example. Okay, so I don't wanna to get too into the details of this because again, it's generally a topic that, that's covered in your, um, your general behavior analytic course. Let's switch gears and talk about social validity. But, but before doing so, let me just go back here with uh, treatment integrity. So. <clears throat> Again, in research, um, you know, thorough studies do evaluate treatment integrity, uh, but not all of them. I would say it's particularly important if you are carrying out a replication uh, where you are systematically uh, evaluating the ability, the, the ability with which somebody can implement a particular procedure, right? You definitely need treatment integrity for that. But again, some comprehensive studies just include it because it's a nice feature to convey to the audience reviewing your study that, uh, hey, you know, we were carrying out a complex intervention and <clears throat> these are treatment integrity scores. Okay, let's talk about social validity. So again, this is yet another important aspect of behavior analytic research. And social validity is something that's been talked about in a, a couple different areas in behavior analysis, but we could think of it as the extent to which the target behaviors are appropriate, the treatment procedures are acceptable to the consumers, uh, whoever that may be, we'll talk about that separately. Um, but more importantly, that there have been <clears throat> important and significant changes in the target behavior, right? That we produce some outcomes that are important to somebody. Um, hopefully the, the participants of the study, uh, hopefully the community uh, at large and so forth. So we want to determine uh, social validity. And if you consider each of these points, some social validity measures are taken during the process, the behavior analytic process, whether treatment or, or research, right? So uh, when we talked about developing target behaviors, we discussed that you would uh, devise a target behavior, maybe based on some interview and observation, but you should review that target behavior with the stakeholders, whether it's the uh, teacher to the classroom you're consulting or parents, uh, or even the individual you're working with, if that, that's appropriate. <clears throat> So you'd wanna do that during the process. Treatment procedures being acceptable. This is an interesting one uh, because you are the professionals, right? So you are the ones that uh, understand which procedures would be appropriate for a given target behavior or a given function. 
So you know the, the body of literature showing uh, what procedures are effectiveness and appropriate, but that doesn't preclude you from checking first to make sure that the procedure is acceptable to the client, uh, to the, the, again, the stakeholders, whether it's teacher or parent. And again, you could simply ask, or what we used to do, uh, particularly if you're using restrictive interventions like blocking and so forth, they would be demonstrated or modeled to the parent, and then we'd have them rate, um, you know, is this acceptable to you? And the, the acceptability scales can be pretty complex. Um, not not complex like psychometrically, but I mean, complex in terms of you can simply ask, is this acceptable to you? Or you could ask some more pointed questions such as, would you feel comfortable implementing these procedures in a public setting, right? So maybe a parent would feel com comfortable with some procedures implementing them in their home, but they would never do it in public. Right, that gives us some, some data or evidence to suggest that maybe this procedure is not the best one, particularly if there's more than one appropriate procedure. Okay, so that's something else we consider. But again, the, the general use of the term is to determine outcomes. Are these outcomes important, right? Did we achieve what we set out to achieve? Uh, are the outcomes socially significant, right? So once again, you could assess social validity simply by asking uh, the client, parents and guardians, teachers, general public, right? You can, and you can see examples of this in uh, studies throughout Java. Uh, obviously, asking the client is kind of an interesting one. If the client is nonverbal, uh, how do we ask them if this is appropriate to you? Well, there's actually an interesting series of studies uh, by Greg Hanley where he uses what's called a concurrent uh, chain schedule to assess clients' preference for certain interventions. So um, I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, basically he arranged a, a, a scenario where if a client, for example, chooses to go in one classroom, intervention A is implemented. If they choose to go into classroom B, a different classroom will say, I don't want to get my letters mixed up. Uh, intervention B is implemented, right? So you give them exposure to each of these interventions, and then you ask them to choose. Do you want to go in classroom A or classroom B? And their choice should indicate which they prefer, right? So even if somebody's nonverbal, there are ways in which we could evaluate social validity for a given intervention. Obviously, asking parents and teachers is a little easier. Uh, we could devise, um, as I mentioned, rating scales and so forth. Sometimes the general public is included uh, in interventions, right? Think about large scale, uh, large scale sort of environmental engineering projects, right? Um, you know, recycling, things of that nature. We might ask the general public how they feel about the approach, the, the intervention, the engineering. Um, and then, of course, the outcomes. Okay, so in social validity, if we were to begin assessing uh, it during the behavior analytic process, we, we could certainly start with target behaviors. So we, we might uh, assess goals. So you'd want to have clear description of the goals and then be able to um, maybe compare that to the performance of a competent person. Right. And again, let's let's step beyond behavior analysis. If you are um, in the sports or you play a musical instrument, right, you may have a particular goal for uh, the, the skill in the sports or the skill on the instrument. <clears throat> and in order to determine the effectiveness of your teaching procedures or what have you or the outcome, you may assess the performance to that of somebody who's quite skilled in those areas. For interventions and treatment, there are some rating scales that are available. Um, you can make your own, right? So I'm sure as school psychologists, you are um, pretty well versed in devising rating scales and so forth. So we could certainly make our own. And in fact, that, that's often what I would do if I had to uh, assess social validity for interventions and treatment. <clears throat> 
For treatment outcomes, uh, that is once we're done intervention or once we're done a study, we present the results and then we want to ask people, um, hey, are these results important? I think they're important, but how do we actually know or how what, what indices can we come up with to determine if they are important? Well, again, if we're working with individuals with learning disorders or developmental disabilities, we could compare outcomes to normative samples, right? So uh, if we're teaching a, a three-year-old with autism, or let, let's change it up to a five-year-old with autism, how to make, uh, how to mand or make requests, we might have a certain goal and a certain target or a certain outcome that we're, we're shooting for, uh, but it, it stands to reason that we might compare those outcomes to a normative sample five-year-old. So on average, how many mans or requests does a typical five-year-old make? Okay, so that's uh, what I mean by normative samples. Obviously, we can ask parents and teachers to assess outcomes. We can call in experts, right? If we're, um, let's just say we're doing a organizational behavior management project. We go into an organization and we're trying to reduce uh, accidents on the job. There might be some experts that we could call in to determine if we've achieved our goal. And then of course there's standardized assessment and a school psychologist, uh, you're probably well familiar with those. <clears throat> okay, that is it for um, treatment integrity and social validity. I, I just sort of added these in. You probably reviewed them before, but I think it, it fits within the context of this class in terms of um, sort of considerations of behavior analytic research or just things related to measurement of. Uh, behavior, measurement of outcomes, and so forth. So hopefully you found that interesting. The last thing I will post is a brief video on putting it all together. My hope there is just to provide you with a, a general overview of, uh, by way of example, of the behavior analytic process in uh, clinical applications. So hopefully you find that useful.